are actually building a long-term preservation system for research data. We have done quite a lot of work with cultural heritage materials, so uh, we have the basics there, and now we are more or less uh, developing the processes that better support uh, researchers and research data organizations in, in, in data preservation. I will not go dwell into in the actual preservation system anymore in this presentation, but I'm going to tell about... Ah, <laughs> yes, no, no, there's nothing yet there. So uh, I'm going to tell you about the pilot, piloting we have been doing in this project with, uh, with, a, uh, with a couple of groups of researchers. Marco, can you please check this? Everything should be okay. <laughs> so while you are checking it out, I can just tell that I and the long-term preservation has not really anything special uh, for you. If you have a good data management plan, if you take careful take care of your data in, in a good way, there's nothing more, more we want uh, in, in long-term preservation from you. So what we, uh, Ella and, and other, other presenters, have, have uh, told to you about the good data management, and what we want in long-term preservation is good data management that also considers the situation when you are no longer there. You may die or you may move uh, to another job or something like that, and the, the, the things must go smoothly even after that. So there must be order. You have to have orderly data, data sets. And you have to take care of the copyright issues, data protection issues, technology issues, and the actual contents of metadata. I'm sure these figures in the, in the slide are right, but I have no idea what these numbers are. So uh, you have to take care of that your knowledge about the data will survive you in the future. And that means that, that there will be changes in technologies, and I would say this is trivial. We have outlived many, many changes in, technology, in IT technology already, and, you have, and the data must outlive organization changes and, most importantly, human changes. And uh, there are natural disasters to take care of, and uh, my this lower part observatio domini Petri de Fermat is what Mr. Fermat wrote to the margin of a, of a book of his that I have found a wonderful solution to this Fermat's great theorem. And but this margin is too small to conf uh, that I could write it down here. So don't do that. Take care of your data in a proper way. Uh, we have. Uh, bit level preservation, which is actual technical preservation, so that we take care of that there are bits. We take, we capture the bits and we keep them alive. And unfortunately, a digital data cannot just be in, shut in a vault and, and wait to, to be pre preserved there. Uh, odd things happen to bits, and, and then you will end up with a 50-year-old file format, and you don't want that. So uh, even bit level presentation is, is active active process where you have to be very aware of changes all the time. And there's an ease of use. Okay, you can open a 50-year-old file format, but it will take a horrible time and effort from you. So uh, make it sure that the user will always be, will always have an easy access to the, to the, to the materials. And then there's a contents or under, uh, presentation of the intellectual content. And when you easily open the file, you still understand what this is about. So you have the content is, in, is good, and the documentation is good, and metadata is good. So that's what we want. And this is what any data management, any data management plan actually requires, only we think in the, in the terms of dozens of years, instead of a few months or a few years. Uh, we did piloting with a, uh, with a free uh, three research groups last year. There have been previous pilots before that, and there are pilots going on as we speak. And what we want in the project is to, uh, to actually talk to researchers of their needs and what the research actually looks like, what, what's the research data. It's a very heterogeneous field, and, and we, we try to grasp some of the salient points of different disciplines, what are the challenges, and, and what, what's, 
what are the common practices. And we also hope that we increase awareness and capabilities of the participants. And, but I repeat, there's no long-term preservation capabilities, really. It's only the good data management what you need. And now I think we have three uh, pilots, and Enrico is going to tell you about the Brain and Mind Laboratory pilot, and when we have the Accelerator Laboratory, uh, Kiiruti Laboratory in the University of Jyväskylä, and the Space Research Laboratory or Avaruustutkimus Laboratory in the University of Turku. And at the moment we are, for example, piloting with genome data, so that it's not only natural sciences that we are, we are, we are working with. But Enrico, please. Hello, hello. Okay, so yeah, so this is gonna be a little bit more practical than what you heard before, even though I will touch points that, for example, Ella has mentioned and also Esapekka has mentioned. So kind of the lesson learned from this long-term preservation project and, you know, the main problem that we face in neuroscience, but it, it's also hopefully for also other scientific fields. So, you know, what I'm saying here should also be applied for your type of data is that the data sets are getting bigger and bigger and everyone has heard about the big data hype. Every other day on the news there's something about big data and or jobs about big data. Neuroscience of course follows, you know, it's not just the hype, it's it really getting bigger and bigger. This is the amount of studies over the years that are using neuroscience data and neuroscience, different neuroscience technique. And even there are many large scale data sharing projects in neuroscience like the Human Connecton project with the, its 50 terabytes of open data the Alzheimer project, 2,500 subjects, and so on. So you can understand that whatever the data is, there's multiple issues when the data is growing, it's getting bigger and bigger. So it's an issue for everyone involved in the data production because with an increasing amount of data, there's, you need to have more efficient way to manage the data, so you need automation. And in general, you, know, you don't want to reinvent the wheel, so you don't want to start inventing your own data format. You want to start using open formats. And for PIs, in general, you know, with an increasing amount of data, you start to losing control on what your students or what your postdoc are actually collecting the data. And you know, if, let's say, 20 years ago in neuroscience, we were happy with the study with 20 subjects, 20 participants. Now you know, the numbers are growing, and you can't really manually go through 100 subjects and check that, you know, that everything is, is OK with their data. So it's not just the data that you want to have control. You also want to have control of metadata. But the issues of larger data set scales also to IT department of a university, to the management, and even to the grant agencies. Because right now it's not possible to track, you know, how much data this project has produced. And out of all this data, which part should be kept, you know, for the next 50 years, or which part could be basically be deleted. And finally, for students and postdocs where to actually prepare the data, at the moment there's no training or tools. Every field has to build your own, its own tools and uh, to basically prepare these data sets. So it all goes down to data management, as you already heard. And there's basically three key issues with data management, the storage of new data, the long-term preservation of current and past data, and the data sharing. And they're all basically the same thing because it all goes down to preparing the data in a, in a good way. So in our field, in, in neuroscience, for example, this is an interview from a couple of years ago. Russell Podra from Stanford is saying that the data preservation practices are really non-existent in neuroscience. So if people do anything, it's usually saving something to a DVD or tapes and then sticking it somewhere to rot. And I've seen it myself. All right, so regarding to this uh, long-term preservation pilot, the pilot worked that first there was a questionnaire about our data, then there was the preparation of the data, and then another final questionnaire. So the I picked a few of the questions, or the most challenging question that, at the, that I had at the beginning of this pilot. So how should we store brain imaging data, and in general any type of data, so that they can be accessed in 50 years? And you know, is there a documented standard to store human brain imaging data? Because you know, you don't want to, as Ella said earlier, you don't want to store some data in Excel, because I, I wonder if in 50 years, you know, there will still be some Excel. Uh, well, that's <laughs> and then, you know, which data and metadata are also relevant to fully replicate the study. So if in 50 years someone else is going to rerun our brain experiment, can they just see it from our 50-year-old data? And also what are the permissions associated to the data? 
So the answer that I tried to give in this pilot, of course, is they were as open as possible, meaning that the only way that in 50 years something can be accessible is to pick an open format and as close as possible to the actual data, to the actual bits. So, you know, it would mean basically simple text files or zeros and ones to store images and, uh, and um, other type of signals. So is there a documented standard where for brain images the reason is, is just recently that they are proposing some uh, candidates and um, I will tell quickly about it because of course it's not in, in your interest. But then which data and metadata are relevant to fully replicate existing results? Well, in our case and in general with experimental sciences, it's not only about the data, you also need to store the experimental protocol so that in 50 years someone can rerun the same experiment and then see, okay, with this new scanner, do we get the same data that we got 50 years ago? Do we get something better? When it comes to the permissions, because we deal with human data, with biomedical data, the, the issue is still open. So I'm going to talk about it at the end. But basically the data format that was prepared for the pilot, this is what we get from the MRI scanner. So it's quite a mysterious files with mysterious codes. The file format is as simple as just organizing the files in a meaningful subdirectory structure. So anyone can just open it and you know that this is subject one, this is his anatomical picture, this is his functional picture, etc., etc. This could work with any other type of data set. So the metadata is already in the folder structure. Couldn't be any more simple. And the extra metadata that is not as simple as a folder structure would just be a simple TXT file or so-called JSON file, which a human can read. You don't need an XML interpreter to, to read what's this file about. So then for the practical part, for this past pilot, we prepare this package, which contain all these subfolders with all this brain imaging data. As well, I also added, because this bits format is quite extensible, so I also added what I mentioned earlier, also the protocol, the experimental protocol. So how did we run the experiment, how we collected this data. Then the third stage of the past pilot was the final questionnaire. And in the final questionnaire, I picked three questions. So how the data is permitted to use? Well, the thing is that with biomedical data, <coughs> Uh, the data set cannot be shared publicly. I'm sure you've heard of biobanks, which are basically entities that are able to you know, collect biomedical data and then decide on a case by case if they can be shared, openly shared or privately shared. In this case, with, the, with our ethical permit, it's really difficult. It's, it's, it's a challenge because now journals, whether it's nature or science, but even smaller journals, they actually want the data with the paper. So when you submit the paper to a journal, you also should submit the data. And right now we have to say finish law doesn't allow us. So how to link the data set? Well, it's kind of linked to the previous step because we can't share the data. We can't give a you know, digital object identifier to the data. So we can't really use the data to be cited. So there's no way you know, to cite the data. And even in the practical part, so where to access the data, it's maybe, you know, the person who collected the data, maybe his boss that knows where the actual data is, in which subfolder, in which server, but at the moment there's, no, there's nothing like this. So I'm basically done. I leave the stage again to ESA. I leave three take-home messages, so if you didn't hear anything from what I heard earlier, just look at this slide. <laughs> and the first take-home message is for the PIs, Try to enforce the best practice of data management from day zero, from the first data set that you collect. It will save your time, your students' time, and it will make it easier to go back to older data set, to share data set, not only share with other labs, even share from one student to another. Sometimes, you know, <laughs> even people in the same lab are not good in sharing, in sharing the data. Second take home message is that standardized data and open formats will make it easier also for other people in the organization, IT people management, the grant agencies to monitor the project to see how much data was done, which part of the data is useful, what should be preserved for 50 years and what can be thrown away. And the third take home message is actually take home questions that you can take home and think about. So what and where to store long term preservation data at the moment, hopefully CSC will come up with a nice tool, but right now there's no such a tool. And then the data expiry date, you know, do we really want to store everything? forever and ever, or should we say that after 20 years, because the technology gets so old, we don't need those brain images from 20 years ago? And then the license expiry date. So in our case, for example, the license is closed. We can't share the data. But would it be like in music that, you know, after 70 years of the death 
of the composer, the music gets free. Would it be the same that after 70 years of the death of the subject, we can actually share his brain data? We don't know. Ethical implications with human data, this is an open issue. We are discussing it with Alto lawyers, but it's something that hopefully will change soon. And now to provide also training to, to students and to postdocs to how to you know, become efficient data managers. So, Esa. Yes, it only remains to me actually to say that, that what Enrico just told you is, was very typical of our findings in the, in the pilots. Uh, we don't anymore have to argue for need of preservation, so it's very well understood and people are really, really grasping the idea that, 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 uh, that, that, that they have to think ab about their data on the long term too. Uh, and in our pilots, we really didn't uh, face any disaster data sets so that we could really work with, with all the data sets we, we intended to. And we also find, found that the research groups actually managed quite well technologically. So uh, the guy said that I have never worked with uh, XML before, but well, he managed to do with the, the, what, what we needed to work with XML. So uh, that was very encouraging. That said, we worked with the natural scientists so that uh, we have to recheck this with, uh, with the arts and humanities, but, uh, but at least partly we are on a good course. And uh, data management plan, life cycle management of the data. So I said, this is the important thing. Of what you left behind, you'll find ahead. If you don't sort your uh, holiday photographs today, you will not sort them anytime because uh, then you just find a pile of photos in a box or on your computer and you don't any remember anymore what, who was who there and, and you are in a mess. So uh, take care of your data from the beginning. And the ownership and rights. So uh, for example, the Turku research, uh, Space Research Laboratory has, uh, they, they have sent an instrument in a satellite uh, on the sky 15 years ago, and they published a paper 15 years ago about it in a paper journal, and they started to wonder that, oh, can we get rights to this? And uh, it turned out that no, the, the publisher wouldn't give them right to, to uh, publish, republish that, that article. So uh, take care of the rights and ownerships and, and those things, because uh, people change jobs, people die, as I say, you have to take care of it now because you don't know what happens tomorrow. And uh, the metadata and, and file formats and things like that are very heterogeneous in research. And I guess this, I hope and I guess this is going to change because the need of interoperability is increasing. People can share data because of IT is developing and, and people want to share data and use it across disciplines. So I hope we will have more standardized world in a few years. But at the moment, try to find the open formats, try to find the, the common practices, at least on your field, and, and use them. And linking data is important. Uh, we have to think more about how we actually link methods and, and publications and data and so on. Uh, preservation is not necessarily the same thing as openness, but one of the important things of openness is that it's one of the best guarantees of preservation because use is important. So if you have data that is very difficult to use, there's no extra eyes to look at it. But when people use the data, they will observe the, the, the mistakes or errors there. They will observe that the file format is a little bit obsolete. You should do something. So in that case, openness and preservation support each other. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, do you have any questions for Enrico or Esa Pekka? Any questions from the remote participants? Ah, yes. oh, here, Maria. Yes. Um, thank you, Enrico. You mentioned that uh, Finnish law prevents uh, some uh, interpretations, and, and we do have uh, had a very strict, uh, strict uh, legal uh, opinions. Um, you mentioned in the nature, ha, ha, do you have examples of researchers from uh, other countries who have been able to release similar data that you are collecting? Yeah. And they have been able also to open, open that as a, 
uh, supporting a, a nature article or something like yeah. that. Yeah, basically anyone from United States, any neuroscience labs from the United States, they are allowed to do that. But even without going that far away, I know people in Belgium, for example, that they are publishing their data in Italy, so it's... Uh, in Europe too. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, the data is to be anonymized as any biomedical yes. data, so you know that you can't reconstruct the face. Of course, one can argue that it, full anonymization is never possible, but uh, you know, it, yeah. it's for good purposes, hopefully. <laughs> Not yeah, that, that's good because the EU actually doesn't, at the moment, require full anonymization. It just has to be uh, likely and, and reasonably anonymized. Yeah. So, but th that's a very interesting point and. Uh, I know we will we will work work with that uh, yeah. problem, <laughs> also at the national level. Like yeah. as the researchers hope, and as Ella said, that all all the researchers in Finland have the similar problems. So we have to work on these together and and reach national solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I actually have a question for you, Enrico. So um, now that you have these uh, process data management processes in place for your neuroscience data. What is your kind of plan for sharing the practices, maybe first within ALT or then nationally and then in Well, the I mean, EU? the thing is that by using, for example, this format that they develop in Stanford, then people, for example, I, 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 I make methods. So I can build my methods on top of this data structure that I can just tell, you know, you give me this data structure and I can process the data. So it's, it's beneficial not only not only for the lab, for the data, but it's also for, for what comes, for what uses the data. So for new software, for new methods, it's, you know, it's the whole neuroscientific community because then someone else from the States can use my pipeline and we all use the same data structure. So, you know, it's, it's easier to share even the software and, and the knowledge, basically, so. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Uh, question for, um, to Esa Pekka. Uh, these three pilots, they were slightly different, all, all from the science area, but still different. Were there any sort of issues that were raised in one pilot, but not in the others? Were there differences? Well, you, I could mention that Uvascula had to tackle the, the question of what to preserve, because uh, the accelerator thing produces like uh, terabyte, terabytes of data in a few seconds, so they would really have to think about what is really the, the data product that is this detailed enough for preservation but which is not too large for practical purposes. Yes, we have, uh, okay, Sami, yes. Uh, yes, um, uh, regarding this uh, data expiry, like um, Esa Pekka just mentioned, uh, in some ways, yes, at the moment we don't have all the storage uh, for all the data. Uh, Produced at the moment, but let's let's think of uh, it th th that way. That uh, if if some data is is uh, managed and uh, curated uh, and uh, and um, so let's say um, resources are are invested in the making of the data, and in some ways it, it is it has a value. And and if we think at the moment, uh, th then at some moment that uh, well, hey, um, we don't see a use for this, and uh, uh, we might actually throw it away. But um, on the other side, um, since we don't know what the future brings, uh, there might be some use, some that we don't actually don't yet quite grasp. And uh, thinking of it also from the technolog technological side, uh, the storage capacity also increases. Uh, and uh, in some ways, uh, the preservation cost will, will come to zero at some point. So. Uh, we have to be careful on, on, on putting expiry dates and, uh, and getting rid of data. So just a comment. We had another question from here. Uh, this is all a bit future oriented because we are lacking those data management plans for our huge backlog of research material. But are there any plans on how to save vital backlog of this material. For example, in the US, we have this big psychology department that I just tumbled upon 3,000 VHS recordings that they say are vital, but <laughs> digitalizing and preserving them will be a huge challenge. So this is just an example. Do we have any 
plans for this backlog? Uh, not any centralized or, or organized plan. And uh, I have to say, unfortunately, that the, the older materials, and this is also warning to you again, that, that do the, please do the data management properly, because it will be very difficult and very expensive to start to do a sort of data archaeology that you have to try to find people who know what is this about and you have obsolete technology as you said vhs videos and so on it will be difficult and expensive and and there is no silver bullet so you have to do it from case to case basis